Okay, good morning everybody. It's not getting later on a Thursday morning, but I think we just have to live with it. Um, today's uh, lecture, I want to talk with you about the whole and the parts. And essentially there's just one message to take out of this course today is that the whole is sometimes not just the sum of the parts. You know, sometimes it is more than the sum of the parts, sometimes it's less than the sum of the parts. But it's something that we really need to think about when we look at these different levels, when we try to understand social phenomena at the macro level and we try to link them with the individuals that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that live in these, uh, in these worlds, in these societies. Anyway, so before we start, I have a question for you guys. You know, this is now nothing about reading or so. You know, this is really um, uh, something else. Yeah, let's see, we'll come back to that later on. So please take out your phone. Take out your phone, your tablet, your computer, whatever you guys have nowadays. Especially those that just walked in, you know, it's perfect timing. Yeah? It's perfect timing. I want to know why did you select the seat where you're sitting right now? Um, the, the, the story, the point that I want to make here is um, uh, Thomas Schelling describes this in his book, the, the macro, uh, the, 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 the macro behavior of and, micro, and micro behavior and macro motives. He um, he looks at these things and and he's he's puzzled by this thing. You know, this is this guy. You know, this is this, this very old guy, uh, Thomas Schelling, Nobel Prize winner, is an amazing guy, amazing guy. Uh, um, uh, I met him twice. And uh, uh, he's just really, really clever. And he puzzles, why can it be that sometimes he gives talks and everybody sits at the back? None of you sits here in the front, right? None of you sits in the front. Well, in this lecture theater, we are lucky, yeah, because the acoustics actually work. But in, but in other lecture theaters, they don't, right? They don't. And still, still what you find is that people tend to sit in the back. You know, Thomas Schelling, he observed this one thing where actually everybody was completely crammed in the last three rows of the theater. You know, they were just completely packed. There was no space anymore. And then there were 10 empty rows in front of him. And there he was standing, giving his talk. Yeah? He wondered, how, how the hell can that be? You know, the, and there are a, a whole bunch of perfectly reasonable explanations for that. Right? So, so here, are, here are some of them. You know, I, I don't know. Most of you just couldn't be bothered. And it's absolutely fine. Right? Uh, and... Uh, um, but some of you, you know, you see, you just wanted to sit next to somebody, right? And now we have some of you who didn't want to sit in the front row. So now put these, seats, these, these things together. So what would happen? You know, some people come in, they sit somewhere, they, didn't want, they don't want to sit in the front row, then somebody else comes in, they want to sit next to somebody, it's going to happen, you all will sit at the end eventually, right? So that's one of those things where, where um, and in, in Shelley's case, you know, he's fascinated by that, and we'll come back to that in the second part of the lecture today, because um, it can be it can be that these that that these kind of situations lead to a scenario where where everybody could be better off, right? If you just want to sit next to body, if you don't want to sit in the in the front row, everybody could be better off. Let's say now we are fine because we have the microphone. This is working out, right? But but uh, then everybody would be better off. If everybody would be sitting five 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 uh, five rows more to the front. Right? Same arrangement like this before, but everybody just more to the front. And that's sort of these things where, where sometimes, you know, when in individuals, and they might even do what is best for them, but collectively the outcome uh, 
everybody could be better, right? Or we all do something that we that we want to do. You know, we we have good the best intentions. We have the best intentions, but still collectively we screw it up, right? And it has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with individuals not wanting to 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 achieve the best for 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 the whole, for the for the society, and so on. It's really just in the in the interactions that we have. And that's sort of um, what I find really fascinating stuff. And uh, that's what we call social dilemmas, right? Social dilemmas that we could be all better off if we would do one thing, but individually we have an incentive to do something else, right? So individually, I'm always better off doing the one thing, regardless of what you do. But collectively, we would all be better off to do the other thing. So that's sort of a social dilemma, and we'll come back to that a little bit. Not too much, you know, this is sort of goes a little bit into the game theory thing. So if you're interested in these kind of things, social dilemma over there, it's a very interesting field. The point that I want to bring across here, that's sort of the point for this lecture, is that the whole is not always just the sum of the parts. It's not just an addition of things. Sometimes the whole, now I'm not saying here the, soul, the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts, I'm saying here the whole is, is other than the sum of the parts. And as you'll see, you know, um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's actually less. You know, and, and sometimes you know, it's, it is just the sum of the parts. You know, the aggregate is merely an extrapolation from the individuals. Uh, in that case, you know, whatever we do collectively is simply the sum of what all of us do in isolation. Here, the whole is exactly the sum of the parts. And when you look at it, to some degree, that is what most sociology assumes. That is what most sociology assumes. They, they think, okay, there are individuals. Once I understood the individuals, I know everything about the society. My point is, no. That might be the case. Yes, that might be the case. For some, for some scenarios, you know, everything depends on everything else, but oftentimes, you know, oftentimes, and that's sort of why I want to bring home this point, is that these situations, we are in these situations where the whole is, is, is not exactly the sum of the parts, you know, and, 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 and it should be the exception, or it is the exception where, where the whole is exactly the sum of the parts, right? And, uh, and today I'm going to try to make that point, let's see how it goes, I'm trying to make this point with, with, uh, uh, in, 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 two, in, two, in two areas, you know, the one thing is fallacies. That's kind of stuff that I touched upon last time already. That when we, when we look at the whole, or when we, you, know, this, you look at society, you look at a group of people and so on, that you cannot necessarily deduce things about the individuals in there. In fact, that it might, be, might lead to really wrong conclusions, right? And that's really important to, to consider because, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know, some of you might end up working for the government or, or for whatnot, or you, you have to make decisions, right? And there you, 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 you collect some information, you see something about, okay, unemployment rate in this county is higher than in the other county, right? And you say, okay, we should do something in that county. Or you say, you look at the discrimination uh, against uh, foreigners, against migrants or whatnot, and you think, okay, we should target our efforts into that area. After this course, I hope that you think more about that. That you think more about, okay, how does the individual and the collective actually link together, right? So this is sort of uh, touches upon the stuff that we talked last time already about, and, and then the next, the second part of the, of the course, or, or the latter third, I want to talk about social dynamics. Okay, but that, let's first backtrack a little bit. So um, remember, um, oftentimes what we want to explain are these macro-level patterns. Right? So it's sort of up there, segregation, network structures, norms, typical beliefs, ways of acting, whatnot. Right? So we are often interested as sociologists in these macro-level properties. Could be something like a crime rate, could be something like unemployment rate. Right? So something, something that we observe um, at the societal level. And our units, or one of our, our most important units, uh, are the individuals. Right? That's you guys. Society consists of individuals. Individuals are within these populations, and, uh, and these populations then exhibit these macro-level patterns. So what I'm saying here is that we need to be careful what the hell we are looking at. Are we looking at the whole, at the societal level, right? Are we looking up, or are we looking down, right? So are we looking at the individuals? And, and these things we need to we need to tease apart, right? Because when we look at the whole thing, you know, there's a car, right? There's a car. Just by looking at the car, you have no idea about the parts in there, right? And you don't have, you have no idea how the car works, right? But also the other way around, right? So if you have 
if you have all the parts, you look at them in front of you, you still have no clue about how the car runs or why it runs. Right? So that's sort of this thing where we need to look at these things from both perspectives. So it's sort of, um, when we look at the whole, and uh, that's sort of the first part about the fallacies, when we look at the whole, um, we cannot make deductions or we cannot draw conclusions about the individuals in there. And in the second part, the social dynamics part, when we know exactly about the individuals, if we don't know how they relate with others, right? if I don't know, if I don't look at this thing that you walked in and you might want to sit next to somebody else, right? so they're relating you to others, I would have no idea, or I could, I, I would draw, a, I, I could draw a very wrong conclusion about why all of you are sitting in the back. Okay, so let's get back to these fallacies, right? So I introduced that the last time already, and the biggest one, the biggest one for us, the most important one, is what we call the ecological fallacy. The ecological fallacy. The ecological fallacy basically says that when we know something about a population, we cannot draw conclusions about the individuals that form this population. When we know something about the population, we cannot necessarily draw conclusions about the individuals in that population. Right? Now you might wonder, okay, so what can we do? Right? So isn't that, uh, isn't, isn't that a little weird? You know, we, we see the, the world, you know, we see the, the groups, uh, the individuals, the communities and whatnot. Why shouldn't we, we be able to say something about the individuals? After all, the groups consist of exactly these individuals, right? Okay, but the point is, you know, we have the group. We cannot necessarily make deductions for the individuals here. This is confusing. Yeah? I'm going to, that's why I'm going to demonstrate this. I'm going to demonstrate this uh, to you uh, with three different examples. Yeah? We're going to look at, um, at admissions, graduate admissions. That sort of picks up on what we did the last time. Remember the Berkeley stuff? I'm going to talk about um, illiteracy. Right? So how, uh, uh, how many people can read, how many people cannot read. Right? And uh, the last one is about the death penalty. So these are all examples, yeah? and these are, these are all, what I think, very important examples. Right? Very important examples when you are a decision maker, uh, you really need to, uh, you are really interested in these kind of things. Right? So in the first case, you know, it's about the inequality between uh, male and female applicants. You know, in the second one, it's going to be about <laughs> migrants and Americans, and in the, in the last one, it's going to be uh, racial differences. Right? Do blacks get sentenced more often to death, or whites? Right. And what you will see is that when you, when you don't know about this ecological fallacy stuff, when you don't know about that, you might draw very wrong conclusions here. And this can have some, some big implications, right? These are big topics. These are important issues. Okay. So let me start with the gender inequality. So you remember there was this, uh, this paper that you guys read for, for last time. You know, there are some social science papers published in science, right, more and more. If you get into this, um, this is an older one, 1975. Uh, was about the admission rates of male and female applicants to the University of Berkeley in uh, California. Um, by the way, you know, Berkeley, a, a beautiful place. If you ever had a chance to go there, Bay Area, amazing. I had this good friend of mine, he was doing his PhD there. So I visited him and asked him, so hang on, uh, Johannes, how can you ever get anything done here? Right? It's beautiful weather, it's amazing, right? And then he said, Thomas, you know, it's like that every day. It's like that every day. It's not like in Ireland or England, as soon as the sun shines, you run out, rip off your clothes. But um, no, it's like that every day. But this study, it was about the admission rate of males and females. And this is sort of how the raw data looks like, right? This is how the raw data looks like. Uh, there were roughly eight and a half thousand male applicants and roughly uh, your, um, less than four and a half thousand female applicants. And there you see the admission rate. So based on this, you know, uh, of the total population, 44% of the males got admitted to the, this is about the graduate program, you know, the graduate school, and, but only 35% of the females got admitted. So if somebody would give you these numbers, you could conclude, right, there's discrimination against females. Males are being favored, right? 
This is sort of what these numbers tell you. 44 is greater than 35. But then, you know, I already introduced this thing. So when we look at the departmental level, and now this is sort of the data about the department, the departments. So you know, these are sort of the, the six biggest departments. Um, they didn't publish the name it's here, but uh, uh, these are the six biggest uh, departments at Berkeley. And now we look at the admissions separately for men and women, right? You see now the column for the male, uh, for the man, and, 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 for, and for the women. And now you see that actually in most of the cases, in, you know, in four out of these six departments, uh, the females got admitted more often than the males. It's exactly the same data. It's exactly the same data. The first time, you know, we looked at it at the university level. Now we're looking at it at the departmental level. And there you can see how, how we need to be careful about these different things, right? Because if you wouldn't dig in, if you wouldn't dig into to, uh, to the departments or to the individuals and so on, uh, your recommendation could have been, okay, we need to uh, do something against... Uh, this uh, favoritism for for male, right? We need to we need to um, we need to reduce the discrimination against females. But now I'm actually showing you that it is the other way around. It is the other way around. This is what we could call a paradox, right? Actually, in the literature, this stuff is called a paradox. It's a, um, it's um, called Simpson's paradox, not because of the Simpsons, right? <laughs> but because this, this statistician uh, called Simpson. And the paradox is it seems that male applicants get admitted more often, but when looking at departments separately, it seems that female applicants get admitted more often. Uh, there was no magic here. I didn't do any trick. Actually, uh, there's not even any social dynamics here involved yet. There's not even interaction here involved yet. Right? It's really just looking at the, at the raw numbers at the higher level and at the lower level. How can we resolve this paradox? Well, I already mentioned that the last time. It's the, the story here is uh, relatively straightforward. Some departments have a lower acceptance rate than others, and females tend to apply more to, the, to these departments with lower <coughs> acceptance rates. So for each department, you know, females still get accepted more, but the overall acceptance rate for that department is lower in general. So when we look at the whole population, which just considers being accepted or not being accepted, it flips the picture around. Right? And Simpson's paradox is when this picture is being flipped around. Right? Now here's one of the examples. You know, in the English department, they're just mostly females, while in the mechanical engineering department, they are mostly, mostly males who apply, and uh, the lower acceptance rate is in the English department, and then the mechanical engineering uh, department has a higher acceptance rate. So when you would look at the at the departmental level data, and this is sort of where it is, you know, now you see on the on the uh, on the one on the on the x-axis, you know, uh, you see the percentage of women applicants. That's sort of what you see down here, right, on, on, on this level. And uh, on the y-axis up here, you see the percentage of applicants getting admitted. Yeah. And the the dots, you know, these are sort of the different departments, and the size is sort of how how big they are. And uh, what you see here now, you know, they put what we call a regression line in there. You know, that's just a, just a model to kind of uh, represent that data in a, in a simpler way. That's it's sort of fitting, fitting a, a, a linear model here. And there you see now this, this negative relationship, right? So um, the departments where more women apply have a lower acceptance rates. That's sort of what this, what this graph here tells us. And that's sort of how this paradox comes about. Females tend to apply more to departments that have lower acceptance rates to begin with. Okay, so that's sort of this, this Berkeley stuff about the graduate admission. It's sort of, a, when you hear this the first time, you need to wrap your head around that. So how does that work? That's kind of really confusing, right? But it's incredibly, incredibly important. I see people who don't consider these things, and then they kind of just look at the macro level. It's a it's very simple, easy mistake to make, right? then they just look at the macro level or they just try to see, okay, and they draw conclusions, you know, and they're very serious about that, but they just didn't do their homework and think about the different levels that are involved here. And this is nothing about, or this is not even analytical sociology specific stuff, you know, because there are no interactions here so far. This is really just about being aware about what your units of analysis are, right? And you really need to be careful about that. Okay. The second example. Now I want to talk about illiteracy. You know, how many people can read and how many people cannot read. 
So there's this study. You now I mentioned uh, the, our flagship journals. Actually, this is the flagship journal, the American Sociological Review. Uh, there's an article. You know, this is old. This is old stuff, right? This is really old stuff. But nevertheless, I think it's still fascinating, interesting, and you guys should know about it. Um, so there was this guy Robinson who um, computed the illiteracy rates uh, and the proportion of the population born outside the the U.S. for 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 the states. Um, so at the state level, right? He looked at how many immigrants live there, and what is the illiteracy rate. Right? So how many people cannot read? These two things, immigrants and uh, illiteracy rate. And he did this. So this is now he used at the unit analysis here, the states. So on that level, he calculated that kind of stuff. Right? And what he finds is that these two figures were associated with a negative correlation of minus 0.53. So what that means is that based on this analysis that he did yeah, at the level of the states, it looked, it looked as if in the states with lots of immigrants, the illiteracy was lower. Lots of immigrants, more people can read. Right? It wouldn't be expected the other way around. Right? Uh, foreigners come in, you know, I don't know, maybe... Um, what, oh, you could, you, could make it, you could make an argument. You could say uh, maybe it's all... Um, you know, I'm a migrant here, so maybe maybe it's about uh, uh, educated people that move. You know, and that's sort of why they why they move there, and that's sort of the reason why um, why their literacy is higher, right? Because um, so you could very easily come up with an explanation for that. Often that's what we do, right? We see these things and we we make we try to find an explanation for that. But as you'll see in a second, this would be a very wrong conclusion. It would be a very wrong explanation here. Because when we look at the level of the individuals, so we go down and we look at um, uh, individual persons, not just the, the, the states, right? but we look at individual persons and we look at um, do individuals, uh, can, they, can they read? Right? Can they read and, uh, and do they have a migratory background? Right? And when we look at that, when we look at that, then there's actually the, the relationship turns around. Then it seems, and that's what they found in this paper, you know, published in, in, in the ASR, uh, then they found in this paper that there's a positive correlation between being a migrant and being illiterate. That means migrants cannot read that well as Americans. Okay? Now this is, again, confusing, right? This sort of flipped it around not just that we, you, know, you would say, okay, maybe our effect became a little smaller or something like that. No, it completely flipped it around. So when you draw a conclusion based on these kind of things, you would go into completely opposite directions now. Right? If you would think about a, an intervention that you would want to have. Again, this is a paradox. How can we resolve this paradox? Well, you know, it seems that immigrants are more illiterate than Americans. At the same time, illiteracy is higher in states where fewer immigrants live. What I want you to take out of these kind of things is that you need to be, you need to be trained, you need to train your brain to distinguish these different levels from each other. Right? You cannot equate them. Right? And in our daily life, we often we do that. We of, often we do that because we're not, we're not trained to look at these different, different levels here. Right? But they are very different things. And the one thing doesn't mean that the other thing has to go into the same direction. Right? How can we resolve this puzzle here about the immigrants? Well, immigrants tend to settle in states where the Americans are more literate to begin with. Right? So the reason why states with fewer immigrants are more literate was in this case not because of the immigrants, but because of the Americans who already lived there. So each individual migrant who came in, you know, not everyone, but on average, you know, they were sort of, um, um, they couldn't read as good as, as well as the Americans, right? But they moved into the states where a lot of people lived who could read very well. And then when we look at the aggregate information, when we look at the aggregate information, we see this relationship that it seems like, okay, there are lots of migrants and there are, there's a lot of literacy here. And the ecological fallacy here is that we think that 
from the knowledge about the individuals, we kind of conclude about the, the, um, the whole, or that from the whole tells us something about the individuals, right? Okay. And again, this is an, an, an important issue, right? If you, if you want to know, or if you're, you're a policymaker in, in the Ministry of Education, and you want to target you know, the counties, um, you want to I don't know, increase the literacy rate, um, you, uh, you could draw very wrong conclusions there. Okay, let me talk about the death penalties. Death penalties. So that was an, another study, um, you know, again published a while back in the ASR in the American Sociological Review, and uh, there they were interested in the effects of racial characteristics on whether individuals who were convicted of homicide received the death penalty or not. Right. So um, you know, they, in the data set, you know, they they looked at some counties in Florida, you know, data from from the late 1970s. It doesn't matter that it's all. So they had around 320 people, and all of them were convicted murderers. Yeah? All of them were convicted. And then they looked at who got the death penalty. OK, now we're talking about race. So this is sort of a very sensitive issues here. And this is sort of stuff where you could see where, where we could draw extremely wrong conclusions. Where we could draw extremely wrong conclusions and, uh, uh, and have very different ideas about how things actually look like. Now what you see is, well, if you look at the, this is sort of the, the total data. Uh, this is sort of uh, um, where these 300 something um, uh, con convicted murderers. And you see 19 of them were white and received the death penalty. 141 of them were white and did not receive the death penalty. 17 of them were black and received the death penalty. 149 of them were black and did not receive the death penalty. Yeah. So let's look at the percentages here. So this is really just simply you know, dividing 19 by 141 plus 19. Right? So this is sort of how these numbers come about. This is sort of the percentages of um, whites and blacks, convicted murderers, who received the death penalty. Looking at this, what would you conclude? Right? Well, 11.8 is higher than 10.2. Right? So in this case, it seems it seems as if whites get sentenced to death more often. You say, okay, well that's great. There's no there's no discrimination here. Uh, I don't know. This is maybe slightly in the other direction, but but we are sort of fine. We are fine. You know, there's sort of there's um, there's uh, no societal problem to worry about. Now let me take these things apart. And now let's look separately at the race of the victim. Right? So first I'm going to look only at the subset of those convicted murderers who killed somebody who was white. So now the, now the victim is white. Right? I still have sort of the defendant's race, white and black. And these are sort of the, the numbers that, that fit in here. So what you see now is that you know there are 19 white who killed somebody who was white and who received the death penalty. There were 132 whites who killed a, a, a white victim and who did not receive the death penalty, which gives us a percentage here of 12.5. Now for the blacks, it's sort of a different story here. Now we have uh, 11 who uh, killed a white victim and who received the death penalty, and we only have 52 who killed a white victim and who did not receive the death penalty. Looking at the percentages here, now that's 17.5. So what would, we, what would we think based on that? Well, it seems that now blacks get sentenced to death more often. Well, you could wonder, okay, maybe this is just about the case for the white victims, and maybe for the black victims it's going to... Because after all, we just showed before that, uh, that whites get sentenced uh, more to death, right? So that's sort of what I showed you before, and the, and the, and the, um, you know, this is sort of... Where are we? This is what we said before, right? We concluded this, that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks. And now I'm telling you the opposite. Okay, now let's move on. Now let's move on and look at, at, the, at, at, the, at the victim's race when, when the victim was black. Okay, let's look at this. Now we have zero whites who killed a black victim uh, we, who received the death penalty. And we have nine whites who killed a black victim who did not receive the death penalty. 
we have six blacks who killed a black victim and then they did receive the death penalty and 97 who killed a black and did not receive the death penalty. And when we look at the percentages here now, again as we did before, none of the whites received the death penalty, but 5.8% of the blacks received the death penalty. So this is sort of a, a big change here, right? And now again, again we would conclude that blacks get sentenced to death more often. So now in both cases, you know, I split it up, I looked at, at the victim's race, and in both cases, in both cases, I see the difference. Well, first of all, you see sort of a huge difference that when the victim was white, people just tend to get the death penalty more often. It's just how the numbers are here. You know, this is 97 in the US, you know. A lot of things happened, happened since, since then for the good. But there it was a huge, huge discrepancy, huge discrepancy. But on the top of that now, when we look at the differences between you know, the defendant's race and um, being white and black, now in both of these scenarios, in both of these scenarios, on the one side, uh, white victim and black victim, we see that blacks get sentenced to death more often. When we look at the total numbers, we would conclude the opposite. Right? There we would say, whites get sentenced to death more often. It's a paradox. It's a paradox. Paradox is it seems that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks, but when splitting the data up according to the race of the victim, in both cases, blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. How can we resolve this puzzle? Well, when you look closer at the data, actually you might have seen it, whites tend to kill other whites. They just don't kill that many blacks. That's sort of how it was at the time. And for killing a white person, at the time, in the 1970s, everybody was more likely to receive the death penalty. And because of that, it sort of flipped this relationship around. But again, it shows us that when we, when we look at these uh, aggregated, aggregated numbers, you know, at the, at, the, at the higher level, we cannot make the logical mistake, and that's what the ecological fallacy is all about, to deduce about the individuals in there. Because the relationship might have been flipped around, right? Because of um, how, how individuals are allocated to groups, for example, right? And that's what we know in the literature as Simpson's paradox. Fascinating stuff, you want to read more about that, um, look, look that up. Okay, so that's sort of the first part. You know, there was no dynamics here involved, no interaction or anything, and uh, I did some magic here, and suddenly at the collective level, things look differently than at the individual level, right? But these things are very important, so, and they are very real. So this is not just a mathematical uh, uh, um, a little uh, trickery or a playing around here, but some real case scenarios you know, where we would draw important and wrong conclusions uh, if you wouldn't consider this fallacy. You know, that's sort of what our units of analysis are. There's something different at the, at the societal level and the individual level. And for us as sociologists, you know, often we kind of we juggle with both of these things. Right? We're not just psychologists, we don't just look at, at individuals, but we also, we also look at, uh, um, at the society. Yeah? And often we calculate things about the society, or we look at the societal things. And, and there, you know, we, because we kind of juggle with these different levels with each other, um, we, um, we need to be particularly concerned about bridging these things, right? And kind of being aware of what our unit of analysis is and um, what's actually happening. Okay, so that's sort of fallacies. Um, let me move on to the second part that I had here. It's about social dynamics. So the point is, you know, of this lecture, I said the whole is sometimes often other than the sum of the parts, right? Fallacy is one part. That's sort of where you need to think about the composition here and where you need to be careful about uh, what you conclude from, from societies, about individuals. Social dynamics is sort of taking it from the other side. So, you know, last time I actually introduced this, I called it the analytical fallacy. You know, that's sort of a term that I just came up with in the middle of the night. But uh, I think it, it might actually, you know, let's see if it catches on, uh, it might actually be not that, not that bad. What I, what I mean by that is that when we know, when we know about isolated individuals, we cannot necessarily draw conclusions about the populations 
in which these individuals are embedded in. Right? The fallacy was the other way around. We know about the population and we cannot induce about the individuals. Now I'm telling you that when we know about the individuals in isolation from each other, if I would know everything about you, right, I still wouldn't be able to, uh, to predict where you guys are sitting. I still wouldn't be able to, to understand why certain societal phenomena come about. Right? And we come back to that, I think we have a whole session on, on, on segregation, because it is very important and, and, and shows this in a very vivid uh, and, and illustrative way, is um, it could be, it could be, you know, and actually there are these papers that individuals want to live in a highly integrated world, you know, they're just all super tolerant and that's actually what they would prefer. But we still end up in a segregated world where people are separated and segregated. Right? So there I would know I would know exactly about the individual preferences and, and individuals would have a preference you know, to, to live in a tolerant uh, uh, um, integrated world, but we still end up in a segregated world. So that sort of doubt of no goes into this other direction that knowing about the individuals or about isolated individuals, we cannot necessarily draw conclusions about the whole population either. This can go in two directions. You know, sometimes one plus one is, uh, is greater than two. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And uh, you know, there are different um, cases where, where this could be. Um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it is exactly the sum of the parts, sort of what, what most of the society assumes. But, but here I'm telling you, sometimes it's actually more than that. And you all know about these things, you know, where, um, where individuals work together and collectively they, ju they just achieve so much more, right? And when we look at, at nature, you know, there are a lot of these examples, you know, where, where individuals or here, you know, like bees or it could be ants or whatnot, uh, individually they, they have no clue what's happening. They have no clue what's happening. Like an ant is running around, a bee is running around, flying around. They don't have the master plan. They don't know what is the big intention here, right? But still, collectively, they, are, um, they can solve problems in an, amazing, in an amazing way. So there's sometimes synchronization happening here and problem solving happening here that individuals by themselves couldn't, uh, couldn't have done. You know, that's this, this thing about swarm intelligence, you know, where, where the whole is sort of um, suddenly more than the sum of the parts. You know, for people, that's actually the same thing as well. You know, we have these examples and we will have next week Next week, I think on, on Thursday, we will talk about this cow. Yeah? And there is sort of, this, don't ask me why there are suddenly cows here, but um, this is a prime example for where the whole is suddenly more than the sum of the individuals. We call that the wisdom of the crowds. A sort of a crowd becomes suddenly very clever, very intelligent, much more intelligent than the individuals would have been. So the whole can be sometimes more than the sum of the parts. But sometimes it's also the other way around, right? Sometimes it is that, um, that the whole is less than the sum of the parts. And these are sort of the, the, the societal problems that I, that I talked about earlier, right? Where we, where we um, individually try to do the best, but collectively we still screw it up. <coughs> and these are often social dilemma situations. So, um, you know, we had this thing uh, where you wanted to sit and so on. You know, Thomas Schelling had this stuff. And uh, why did he care? Why did he care about these kind of things? Well, he cared about it because he said, um, maybe, maybe, the, the, maybe this teaches us something about other phenomena in the world. You now he refers to residential location. Where do people want to live, right? And maybe it shows us something where people, I didn't ask you this question, but if we have more people, you know, I would have asked the question, um, and the acoustics are bad, do you like where you're sitting? Right? Because then you, you, can, you can often find this, you know, that's sort of what, what anecdotally uh, Thomas Schelling found here, um, when he looked at uh, where people are sitting, um, that most of the people were unhappy with the outcome. <coughs> and that's sort of, what we can find here, that most of the people are unhappy with what we all achieve collectively, but individually they, they, they went for, they did the best that they could. Right? And the story here is, and that's sort of the, the tragedy, that everybody could have been better off. <coughs> everybody could have been better off, I don't know, sitting further to the front in Schelling's case, right? or everybody could have been better off to um, some other things. And, um, and again, these sort of are, are real world scenarios, right? I don't know, you guys are too young for this, but, but think about the arms race that we had, the Cold War, right? 
everybody was just just building up arms, right? And uh, uh, you know, actually, that's what Thomas Schelling won the, won the Nobel Prize for, uh, because he did a lot of game th interesting game theoretical work on these kind of things. Everybody built up thousands of nuclear missiles, you know, the states and, and, and the Soviet Union at the time, but, but they could have all been better off if they wouldn't have done it, right? And they could have, could have all saved money, or nothing happened, nothing happened at the end of the day, but nothing could have happened as well if nobody would have had any weapons, right? So there's sort of this thing where, uh, where there can be a tragedy, there can be a dilemma that uh, when, when we would be collectively better off if everybody, but, but our individual interests go, go against that. So let me introduce this tragedy of the commons thing. Um, something that Garrett Hardin uh, wrote about. Let me first talk about what the commons are. So commons, commons are, when we refer to the tragedy of the commons, commons are sort of common goods, right? Stuff that, stuff that either nobody owns or we own collectively somehow, right? This could be, you know, the air, or it could be whatever, the fish in the ocean, or, <coughs> Garrett Hardin, you know, and that's sort of in the further readings uh, for, for today's lecture. Garrett Hardin, he talks about uh, uh, grazing. Right? He talks about uh, land that farmers can send their, their sheep to. I don't know if you guys have that in Ireland. Uh, you know, I'm not here for that long yet, you know, but in, let's say in Sweden, for example, or in other countries, they actually have that. They have they call it what they call it. In Sweden it's called almende. It's sort of stuff that belongs to everybody. Stuff that belongs to everybody and everybody can send their cattle there to graze, right? Sort of something that we own collectively. Now, what is the tragedy, right? So we have commons and we have a tragedy. Well, the tragedy is that Hardin exemplifies this in the case of this grazing stuff, you know, sending cattle to the, to the, to the common ground. And he says that farmers will tend to maximize their own profits by increasing their herd or increasing their gathering of resources without regard to the long-term depletion of the land. Because regardless of what you do, Regardless of what you do, I will always be better off to send more sheep to this uh, common land because then that will give me uh, more outcome at the end of the day. So the key here is that regardless of what the others do, I'm better off, I'm better off um, exploiting, exploiting this. And you know, that's sort of what he, what he meant here. It's rational for the actors to, to do that uh, because the benefit of the individual farmers you know, sort of outweighs the, the cost that, uh, that, that is um, associated with that. Because when you think about, you know, there's this common land, right? So we all send our sheep there, and then I send one, one sheep more on, on this land, and this sheep eats a little more grass, and then uh, all of us will, get, will have a little, a little less grass than that, but sort of when I look at the share of how much grass is sort of now not there for me anymore, it's less than what I gain out of it by exploiting, exploiting it, right? By, by depleting the resources. So that's sort of this thing where, where, where Hardin uh, says, you know, he became a very controversial figure afterwards, uh, where he says that, um, this is sort of a, a problem why, these, uh, uh, why, uh, why common goods might be so difficult to defend, right? Because individuals, they benefit from them, they benefit from exploiting them, they suffer from exploiting them, but they suffer less from them because the suffering is based, essentially the suffering is shared amongst all of us, but the, but the exploiting is the thing that uh, individuals receive. So that's sort of the thing where now the individual interests and the collective interests, they are sort of at odds with each other, right? They are at odds with each other. And um, when everybody has an incentive to overgraze, you know, this, remember this example of sending cattle or sheep to the, to the common, common land, to the common, uh, everybody has an incentive to, do, to overgraze regardless, regardless of what the others do. Right, regardless of what the others do. And then eventually, and that's sort of the, the crux here, that's sort of the, the tragedy, eventually we will deplete the resource. Right? Everybody has the individual incentive to do that. If, if you are, I don't know, if you are a business or whatnot, you, that's kind of what you would do. You would send more, more, uh, more cattle there. But eventually all of us uh, would suffer from that. So there is a serious effort here needed to coordinate, right? So sort of tell people, okay, now don't do that in a way. So there needs to be an authority that steps in. If we just let the individuals run away and try to solve this by themselves, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. That's sort of where the whole is actually much worse than the sum of the parts. Right? And when you look at where this is coming from, you know, we have this utilitarian view, you know, Adam Smith and another dude, and this is old stuff. They thought that we just need to live in a world where individuals do the best, what, what is best for them, and we will end up with a world that is best for everybody. 
But now I'm saying you, telling you, no, that's not the case. Right? And that's actually where, where these dilemmas come into play, where then things can go really bad. Right? Things can go really bad, and we, we could, could block each other, and um, everybody uh, could be worse off than uh, if uh, nobody would have overgrazed in this case of what Hardin says. Right? Okay, so that's sort of the tragedy of the commons. There are other examples for social dilemmas. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma, maybe you heard about the prisoner's dilemma. It's about this interesting thing, you know, let's say, um, let's say you and I, we, uh, we committed a crime together, the police arrest us, right, and then we're being interviewed in separate rooms, and then, um, and then uh, you know, I'm, each one of us is being offered a deal from the police, right, if we, if we uh, denounce the other one, we will get a reduced sentence, but if we don't denounce, then, um, if we don't denounce, there are two scenarios here. If you don't denounce and I don't denounce, the police has nothing on us. Right? They have to let us go. But if I don't denounce, I shut my mouth and you denounce me, then I'm really screwed. Right? So in that scenario, I actually I have an incentive to denounce you. I have an incentive to, because regardless of what you do, if you don't denounce and I denounce you, I'm better off. I get sent off. You know, uh, and if you do denounce, I denounce you as well. Then I get at least get a, at least get the deal. Right? So that's sort of the thing where individually and collectively, again, our interests are opposing. Our interests are opposing. But the main story for today was really thinking about the whole being sometimes different than the sum of the parts, reading for next week. Um, and that's going to be the last session where we have these more theoretical things and then we get into, into more nitty-gritty details. So this chapter by Peter Esser and Richard Swedberg, it's on Blackboard. Thanks.